First of all, I wanted to um, thank everyone for coming uh, to uh, what I hope will be an exciting um, talk about um, this wonderful book. Um, I first, I'm going to start by introducing um, the author. Um, I also, before we started, wanted to get a sense of um, how many people have read this book already, just so we could get a sense of um, how the ways that we talk about it and whatnot, and the ways that we encourage all of you to actually pick up a copy of the book <laughs> that's outside. Um, so, so one person has? OK. Um, I will first start with um, the author. Now, again, this is a bio that's um, the official sort of <laughs> bio. Uh, I, uh, I asked uh, Omar earlier if there were things that he wanted to add or whatnot, because I understand myself how sometimes tedious <laughs> official bios can be, and how um, they tell us where we got our education and what are our official titles, but they leave quite a bit out of what constitutes uh, who we are and what um, what are the things that mean something to us beyond uh, the categories of the schools we've been educated in and um, the official titles we may hold. So I'm going to read the official one, and um, we'll leave it open for to Omar to add any things, not only directly no, after, no, no, but they, exactly, but, but also maybe throughout um, as he begins to discuss um, the book, other things you want to share, whether it's about your father and other, um, you know, just other things about um, how you got into what um, you are doing and then how you came to write this book. Because, of course, um, that's uh, some things that I'm uh, totally interested in, but I think um, everyone here would love to hear more about that. So I'm going to read, um, as I said, the, the official uh, bio, knowing that there's uh, far more um, amazing things to learn about Omar and his life. Um, Omar Shahid Hamid has served with the Karachi police for 12 years, most recently as head of counterterrorism. During his service, he's been actively targeted by various terrorist groups and organizations. He was wounded in the line of duty and his office was bombed by the Taliban in 2010. He left Karachi for a sabbatical when there were too many contracts on his life. He has a master's in criminal justice policy from the London School of Economics and a master's in law from University College London. And this is his first book. Now, um, before I hand it over, just very quickly, my name is Anila. Uh, Doladzai. I'm a visiting professor here um, at Harvard in the Divinity School, so a professor of uh, women's studies and Islamic studies. I myself am, a, am an anthropologist of Afghanistan and Pakistan. And um, in Pakistan, I work in um, KPK, which is Khyber Pakhtunkhwa <coughs> and the tribal areas in Pakistan, but have lived um, um, throughout Pakistan and have taught uh, just recently at the Lahore University of Management Sciences. So I've spent um, a lot of um, my life uh, living and working in Pakistan. And um, in Afghanistan, I uh, worked as an anthropologist for four years doing field work for which I'm writing my book. So that's just some background about me um, that hope, uh, hopefully will inform um, the conversation that we have about this book and how Pakistan is represented and the questions that we sort of tackle. So you get a sense of where I'm coming from and um, the, the projects and issues I'm involved with as well. Thank you so much, Omar. Thank you, Welcome. Ms. Lodzi. Yeah. It's uh, indeed a <clears throat> great pleasure for me to be here. And as I was talking to some friends earlier, it's also somewhat surreal because I find myself back in Cambridge after 24 years. The last time I was here, I was a Harvard brat. So my parents were here. Um, I did nothing meritorious uh, in that. But uh, what was funny was that I was, as I was walking around this morning, uh, it struck me that a lot of times, it, it certainly seemed to me, uh, in small towns, things change very little, or at least ostensibly. You know, you can kind of, uh, I went to the sort of ice cream shop where I used to go as a kid 24 years ago, went to the comic store where I used to buy comics. It was exactly the same. I think even the attendant was the same problem. <laughs> you know, the same hippie type of guy, looks like the older, but. But I think, uh, in contrast, the other, place where I've spent a large part of my life, which is Karachi, uh, change happens and has happened in my lifetime very rapidly. The, the Karachi that uh, I see today is totally different from, certainly it, it is an entirely sort of different world from the Karachi of 24 years ago. And indeed, I find that even though I left Karachi, uh, I moved from Karachi to London in 2011. But every time I go back, and I was last back last week, literally, uh, I find that the environment in Karachi is different. The, uh, you know, the sort of political dynamics of the city, 
uh, its push and pull factors, whether it's in media, whether it is uh, to do with uh, economic pressures, mean that it's, uh, you know, it's a pitch that is constantly, constantly mm. changing. And uh, the book, uh, this book sort of, you know, focuses on, Karachi is, is, is the setting piece to it. So it's not, uh, you know, it, it's lay, it's the sort of stage uh, which is used uh, to describe a lot or to try and uh, describe a lot of what has happened mm -hmm. uh, in Karachi over the past uh, 20, 30 years. And the main, one of the main narrative themes in that has been Karachi's relationship with violence. So, you know, the one perhaps constant, uh, if we look at this, <coughs> sorry, over the past 25 years, has been that for one reason or another, Karachi has, uh, you know, bred cycles of violence. Uh, these cycles have come in different shapes and sizes. Uh, and they have adapted uh, according to, uh, you know, global politics. So, uh, we had, for instance, the phenomenon of following 9-11, we had the phenomenon of uh, the first major uh, Al-Qaeda related uh, crime, which was the kidnapping of uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, reporter Daniel Pearl in January 2002. Soon after that, I think in May 2002, we had the first suicide bombing in Pakistan, which, you know, these sorts of things had never happened before. Uh, and you had this whole wave of uh, jihadist violence that kicked off. And again, jihadist violence, or, or rather the presence of jihadists, was never a new thing in Karachi. Karachi, going back to the 1980s, uh, you know, during the Soviet-Afghan war, was a hub. It was at that time Pakistan's only international airport. So naturally, uh, the sort of wandering uh, group of of various nationalities who ended up in Afghanistan at some point or the other passed through Karachi. A lot of the figures whom we subsequently saw rise to prominence, if you kind of follow, uh, you know, the inner workings of various jihadi groups uh, have studied or spent time in Karachi, whether it was people like uh, Masood Azhar, who was the head of Jesh, the Kashmiri group Jesh Muhammad, whether it was Mullah Umar, who was reputed to have spent time in a, in a Karachi madrasa. Uh, and the interesting thing is that uh, the jihadist or sectarian side of this is actually only one aspect of Karachi's violence. Uh, you would think that, you know, for any normal city that should be enough, but, uh, you know, this is Karachi and uh, we like to sort of uh, exceed beyond uh, everything. Uh, you know, the other factors in it have been uh, crime, uh, the emergence of gangs, uh, especially in localities like Liari. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, very sort of uh, convoluted and almost dynastic uh, gang wars that, that have gone on from one generation to the next. So the guys heading the, the gangs in Liari today are very different, uh, are in fact uh, related to or sons or nephews of the guys who were running Liari 24 mm. years or 25 years ago. And then, of course, we've had the big uh, issue of ethnic violence uh, and violence connected or politically uh, connected violence uh, stemming from uh, almost all of Karachi's political parties uh, actively running armed militias and enforcing their political writ through those militias. The largest of those parties, of course, was the MQM. Uh, and, you know, uh, by virtue of its being the largest, it also has... Uh, over the years had the largest armed uh, element. Uh, and again, we see that uh, they're back in the news now, uh, especially in the last couple of weeks with, uh, with a, an operation uh, ostensibly underway in Karachi, especially targeting the MQM. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the headlines that we see today, in fact, are very similar to the headlines that we saw in the mid 90s, when at that time the state was involved in a sort of tug of war with the MQM. So the purpose of the book really was to kind of uh, try and walk the reader very gently through this kind of the process of change and the process of these cycles of violence in Karachi. And uh, the book is told uh, or, or is narrated through the eyes of police officers, because if there's been one other uh, constant institutional witness to all that has happened in Karachi, it has been the Karachi police. The police in Pakistan in general, and Karachi in particular, is often a much maligned institution, and rightly so. 
uh, we don't do our jobs, we're usually corrupt. Uh, but especially in Karachi, I think that narrative, uh, there's another side of that narrative. And I think the other side of that narrative is uh, that over the past uh, 20 odd years, the tremendous sacrifices uh, that the Karachi police has, has had to kind of uh, give uh, fighting against uh, or trying to sort of uh, work, not even fighting against, but at times just trying to survive in the city would sort of astound anyone anywhere else in the world. Uh, you know, if we look at figures, uh, 500 police officers have were killed in the past 10 odd years just because they had been, they were targeted and killed mm. just because they had been part of the 90s operation against the MQM. The number of police officers who have been targeted by, you know, sort of IEDs or uh, suicide bombers or by sectarian groups or jihadist groups. Uh, Professor Dolazite mentioned, of course, that my officers were attacked, mm -hmm. were, were blown up back in 2010 by the TTP. Uh, but these sorts of numbers would, you know, kind of uh, alarm anyone outside of an actual yeah. war zone. And, you know, uh, yeah. I'm sure that, uh, you know, Kabul has similar statistics, but yeah, obviously that's an active uh, war zone. Uh, and it's, it's fascinated me that um, I don't think that this has really gotten a lot of uh, press. It, mm. It's it's an aspect of Karachi's violence. I mean, it's Karachi's violence has been looked at from an academic point of view, from various angles, you know, from the victims, from mm. the participation of the militants, whether religious, sectarian, mm. or ethnic. But the uh, the role of the police, what they've kind of gone through, and what they sort of do uh, just to survive on a day to day basis is something that uh, has not been documented very well. And part of the reason for that, and that, the major reason for that, is of course that the police, like police forces anywhere in the world, is a very fraternally uh, closed organization. So outsiders usually do not have very good ingress. You know, cops are not gonna talk to you and tell them you their stories if you're a journalist or if you're a mm -hmm. anthropologist. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have no ostensible reason to publish or to reveal these stories on their own. Mm. So it's, uh, I found myself in a very unique position uh, when I kind of began writing this book because, uh, you know, as I keep saying, I don't have a creative bone in my body, but the book began as a sort of cathartic process at a point in time when I was quite frustrated in my, in my police career. Uh, and then it just snowballed from there. And the interesting thing about it was that in my time in the police, uh, I found that the stories that we told each other as cops were fascinating. I mean, they were more kind of gripping than the best thriller that anyone could mm. write anywhere in the world. And uh, they were sort of, you know, they every time they kind of reinforced the fact that at times truth is much, much stranger than fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you couldn't have a Hollywood scriptwriter make this stuff up. Uh, but they were, you know, there was a treasure trove of, uh, of information there uh, that was, that had never been tapped. Mm -hmm. And I guess when I sort of started writing the book, I, I wouldn't say when I started writing the book, but as the book gained steam, mm -hmm. uh, this aspect of it uh, came to the fore more and more. And for me, uh, subsequently became very important to be able to tell these stories without glossing anything over. Um, I think uh, those of you who have read the book or those of you who will, will find that this is not uh, a particularly heroic portrayal of the police mm -hmm. because that's not what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not also the typical sort of negative portrayal of the police mm -hmm. that you often have in South Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an attempt to kind of portray these characters um, in a nuanced way to show their reality, you know, mm -hmm. they are uh, they are ordinary people uh, stuck in a very very difficult situation mm -hmm. uh, where they have pressures on all mm -hmm. sides. You know, they they have uh, there's political interference in their jobs. Uh, there is rampant corruption, not only the corruption that they may uh, kind of uh, do or partake in from uh, outsiders, mm -hmm. but within their department. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, uh, you know, even to do the right thing, uh, you have to often go about it the wrong way, mm -hmm. uh, just to sort of uh, just accomplish that goal. 
Uh, and yet, at times, uh, you know, it's a it's a horrible job. It's you know, on on average, uh, twelve hour shifts, bad pay, uh, bad sort of uh, quality of life. Any which way you look at it, mm. and yet at the same time, at times these uh, men and women do who again very ordinary, very flawed individuals, uh, do extraordinary things. Uh, so I think you know the book kind of became uh, a uh, a sort of uh, I won't say a memorial, but it became. It wanted the book start tried to acknowledge that yeah. fact, uh, and and the fact that uh, you know policing is not an easy job in a in a city like Karachi. Yeah. So just to go back to your um, uh, when you were talking about how you started this, did you you didn't imagine it as a book? It was sort of just you putting it writing as, something as my diary or something. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, and of course, uh, fiction allows me a lot more license to, right, to right. You know, sort of name and shame whoever, uh -huh. I, whoever I wish to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's always good. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it, it never started out as a book. Mm -hmm. It was not a creative project. Nice, as such. nice. Okay. Yeah, and that, I mean, what what's clear? From, um, so I'm I'm encouraging everyone to pick up the book. Um, I'm not being paid for this <laughs> for this plug, but I'm encouraging everyone because, and that's one thing that I, as an anthropologist and an ethnographer, really appreciated was uh, the ethnographic detail, right? And his um, the task of just trying to document and carry us through the struggle without judgment of people and the decisions they make in their lives, right? So it's just the struggle, and and, and in my context in Afghanistan, um, I've I've written. Um, about how it is that I focus on the ordinary Afghan and how they try to live like a livable life um, in, in the face of what's been given to them. And, and one of the lines um, that really struck me that, um, that resonated in many ways with my work in Afghanistan and Pakistan is how you say that these ordinary police officers are trying to live an honorable life in a dishonorable space. And how do you do that? How do you enact the everyday projects of doing justice to everything that means something to you, whether it's family and the sacrifices and the compromises you make for family, for nation, and how it is you use that in different ways, Absolutely. right? Because that's yeah. and that's something yeah. that I really appreciated that you prob that you uh, problematized, and I'll go into some of that more. But you know, then even religion, right? And how it is that the um, ordinary everyday Muslim or Christian summons his faith in the ordinary ways, not in the big, large, yeah. you know, dramatic yeah. ways. And so I really appreciated those. When in making your comments, I just wanted to, again, encourage everyone, because it is, um, as, as you said, uh, you know, a unique <coughs> position. Because as an anthropologist, I would, um, I would not have had the access that, that he had. And, and that's, um, you know, even though I, I spent four years in Kabul to get the access that I had, it, it is really quite a unique um, and you see that. And, in, and I don't know if many people have watched um, The Wire here. Um, in many ways, um, the way The Wire, um, have you seen The Wire? I've seen the occasional episode, yes. OK, well, Omar, I encourage you <laughs> as you as you, you know, it's, move it's, on. It's yeah, next it's just, on my Netflix. Yeah, it's just, no, exactly. For me, it's, um, it, as an anthropologist, as an ethnographer, as someone trying to understand the contemporary and the role of violence and the role of institutions, whether it's the police and how ordinary people, whether it's um, you know, the, the citizens of a space like Baltimore or the state institutions like the police, how they are. So for me, it's that gritty side. And it really uh, it, it resonated, <coughs> again, in many ways with some of the ways that you, because um, you know, I'm a huge fan of the wire. I'm not a huge fan of TV, but that's something that TV in America did right. So it resonated in many ways of your descriptions of, um, you know, characters and and. Um, I think that's I think that's true, and I think it's um, it's very difficult. I think anywhere um, to kind of look at uh, issues like uh, or or sort of you know institutions like law enforcement institutions, mm -hmm. because as I said. By nature, they tend to be closed door. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, uh, because they play such a central, and this is not just true in Karachi, but I would say you know, anywhere in the world, you'd probably find that this is true in Boston or New York. Uh, because they play such a crucial role in the dynamics of that city, mm -hmm. it's almost as if if you don't have access to that in inner world, you really don't understand half the things that go They're on. Gone. And the reasons behind them, and so you know, a lot of times uh, I've uh, had the phenomenon of sort of 
reading something in the papers, understanding because I was privy to what was going on the behind person. the scenes, what triggered this. But the public reaction mm -hmm. of people who were not in that world was totally different. Mm -hmm. they, their sort of, of uh, you know, Forced focus, down, exactly, yeah. your focus was totally different and totally off the mark. Very good. Yeah. I don't know if you if you have more because I have. I no. I mean, I, I was. So I don't know. Yeah, if this I, is I, useful. I thought I'd, I'd keep uh, myself brief and we can open up to questions. Okay. Um, there were. I mean, if you don't mind, if I um, absolutely sure. Um, uh, give a few comments and whatnot, sure. um, and then open it up for any um, questions people uh, might have. For me, um, I'm going to read um, two um, sections that I thought, and the, you know, and before I do this again. Um, as I said, what I appreciated about was that ethnographic um, detail, right? As an anthropologist, um, my bias comes out as to why um, I'm reading this particular passage. Um, anthropologists, particularly anthropologists of the contemporary, particularly the work I'm doing, I'm a, uh, somebody who's an anthropologist of the state. So I, uh, I look at state institutions and I really appreciated not only how you complicated the state, and the role of the state in the lives. And so there's state, there's nation, right, and religion. So I'm, I'm going to be choosing um, a couple of passages. Sure. So then we can um, start off some of the um, discussion. Um, so here's uh, one just about the role of the state. And it's on page 212. Um, Constantine had always believed in the inherent strength of the state and its institutions. He was, after all, a police officer, a member of the coercive arm of that state. He always, held that no one, he always held that no one could overthrow the state, no matter how powerful they were, because the state would always be more powerful. So many had tried, but at the end of the day, the state prevailed. It was so strong in its foundations that all it had to do was send out minions like him and Akbar to deal with such pretenders. The UF had been a perfect example. For all the party's street power and its scores of ruthless militants, ultimately they were no match for the resources of the state. Therefore, it had surprised him in these past four days how quickly that same state, that same usually self-confident state, had begun to unravel. In fact, it seemed as if the state had vanished altogether. Now, before um, like I had a spoiler alert and tell you what happened in these things. But just, you know, just from that passage to see how he's complicating the state and its institutions and how um, it resonates in the lives of, of, and lives in the lives of people of, in, in Karachi. But then also in a different place, you talked about um, ordinary Pakistanis, right? And how um, they're good people, but once they join institutions, that's when they become... Um, uh, I don't know the word you use, but how they become changed by institutions, right? And so for me, I, you know, as somebody who had, I grew up in Los Angeles, right? My parents are from um, the Peshawar area. But for me, it was, um, so not only someone who has gone back, but then somebody who studies Pakistan um, and contemporary. For me, the, um, I have to be honest with you, when I um, finished reading this book, and for many of those, uh, many of us, I think, of our generation who have this, um, or of any generation, have this complicated relationship to Pakistan, where um, I just had to put down the book. And yeah, I, I did cry. And not many books, uh, because every book on Pakistan makes me frustrated for a different reason, right? And that reason sometimes has to do with the fact that how writers chose to uh, ride on the wave of liberalism and on uh, imaginations of Pakistan in the West to make success and whatnot, and you know, certain narratives that just are sexy. Um, this book um, complicates Pakistan in all the ways, but it still leaves you with that rock in your stomach going, so what, um, what do we do as people who have um, a certain relationship to, for me, it was never about a nation, to tell you honestly. My family, um, just, you know, my family was against the creation of Pakistan. We were uh, Khudai Khidmatkars that were against the creation. So it was never about a nation. <coughs> it was about the ordinary Pakistani and um, their struggle. And every time I go back to Pakistan, which upsets my dad, tell you frankly, it, uh, it upsets my father because he's from a generation that wanted a, a, a different Pakistan. My father was arrested. And in fact, my recent stay in Pakistan <coughs> until um, June 2014 teaching at Lums, I had my own private spy following me, the ISI. <laughs> every day, right? And it's, and it's because of my family's history and the work that I do, right? So, but I go back. I still go back. And even as, as a female going back and being followed by ASI spies, by, hounded by them, being pulled over by them, 
at, at any moment, right, I still go back. And it's that, um, the, it's the everyday Bakasani, the one and many that were in your book that, that are just struggling. When you meet them that are far more dynamic than any imagination people have of Pakistan or of a Pakistani. And so for me that, you know, I'm just giving you my personal as I, as I read it, but then also how you've complicated the state um, and also how you portrayed um, the army. Because many of us, I don't know, have complicated <coughs> relations to the Pakistan army. Uh, how basically you portrayed the army as the nation's pimp. Right? Um, and in, in that, I'm going to read, if you don't mind. Absolutely. A more... I um, thought I was the only one who had a complicated relationship with the army. <laughs> no. <laughs> and, and, if, and if you and I would be the only ones, I would be surprised. But I definitely do as well. As I said, I have my own private um, spy <laughs> when I am in Pakistan. So, um, and please, um, for all of those in the room, please excuse um, um, the, the candid language. In See, this. At least. <laughs> um, okay. What do you mean that you don't wish to help us? It's not a matter of wishing. If you have any information about this matter, you cannot withhold it. It is a matter of supreme national importance. The nation's honor is at stake. The major's voice rose as his self righteous indignation came to the surface. Fuck the nation's honor. The words were spoken softly, but with such viciousness that the major looked as if he had been physically struck. Constantine's body tensed, preparing to step in to tackle in case either of the men became physical. The major was on his feet. Look here, you can't talk like that. I have served in this army for 11 years. I will not let anyone speak about the country in that fashion. Akbar waved him away. Please save it for some stupid chutia straight out of the training college, Major Saab. I'm not some child still suckling at his mother's breast. I know how your people work and how long they've been raping the nation's <coughs> honor, as if it were some two-bit randi standing on the street corner. You people use words like honor and country to get people to do what you want them to do, then throw them away like a used condom. I'm one of your condoms, too. Tell Tarkin I haven't forgotten that. <coughs> Right, so for me, as I said, complicating that, but then also religion throughout, right, and the role of um, the complicated ways that religion is summoned up. For me, as I told you just very briefly, um, my family's position and relationship to partition, but how religion was used to create a state <coughs> that ultimately, whether it's uh, the founding father of Pakistan or those after, that have continued to use religion um, uh, in in ways, right? And I don't know if you want to comment or if you, <coughs> if you don't, because so, I don't know if you have your private spies when no, you go to Pakistan, uh, but I would certainly be um, sensitive to that. It's, it's interesting because, um, you know, this, this whole point that I try and uh, make in the book about the fact that, uh, as we all know, and doesn't, doesn't come as a surprise to anyone, that the deep state uh, has a very sort of pervasive role uh, in Pakistan. Uh, sometimes, in fact, that role comes about in ways that uh, that we don't, we ourselves don't realize. I mean, I almost on a daily basis, or rather, whenever I'm back in Pakistan, find out something new which I was totally unaware mm -hmm. of uh, in the past, even having been a part of that <coughs> of that deep state. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think one of the, one of the interesting things here is that how uh, when dynamics change, uh, you know, the, the sort of functionaries of the state or, or whether it's the intelligence agencies or whatever, uh, turn around their kind of focus immediately. And I always like to relate a story. Um, when I sort of, I was pretty new uh, to the police. I was, I was still under training attached to a police station. Mm -hmm. uh, this was in the summer of 2001. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> at that time, there had been a spate of sectarian murders in Karachi. So uh, Sunni extremist uh, groups were going around killing Shia professionals. So they weren't targeting Shia yeah. ulema, yeah. but they were killing doctors, doctors and, and dentists professors, and, and, and you know, professors yeah. and things like that. And, uh, and it had become sort of so bad that whole, you know, large numbers of Shia families were migrating to the States or to the mm -hmm. UK or wherever. Uh, and I remember that at one point uh, we were told uh, there was an officer. I was just, you know, sort of uh, with no official responsibilities, just to sort of fly on the mm -hmm. wall type of thing. 
And the officer I was with, we were told that, right, you know, we've had enough. This is a now, now a major problem. We need to go and uh, at least, at, apart from obviously the investigations into these cases, it was felt by the police station that there was a need to clamp down on a lot of the uh, officers of these sorts of groups who were very openly putting out radical uh, literature or hate literature mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, and I remember we went uh, and it was uh, an office uh, of one of these groups in a relatively upscale location mm -hmm. in Karachi. Uh, it was above a sort of uh, video market type mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. And we went, we shut down, we sort of, you know, we, we sealed the offices, we took all their posters mm -hmm. and all their sort of uh, pamphlets and all. And there was one guy who was sitting in the office, we took him to the police station. And uh, <clears throat> he sat in the police station till I think the evening. Mm -hmm. And at about 5, 6 p.m., this sort of operation that had been taken place across Karachi mm -hmm. lost steam because we then received new instructions that, you know, let them let go. Them. Yeah, you know, uh, they're sort of uh, the military or the agencies that said, look, you know, don't sort of get into this right now, et cetera, et cetera. So we actually handed the guy back all his pamphlets and everything. And the funny thing was that this was, if I recall it correctly, the first week of September 2001. Mm -hmm. 10, 15 days later, the world thing. changed. Mm -hmm. And I remember subsequently, uh, you know, when I was in CID, a lot more experience in dealing mm -hmm. with sort of, you know, uh, these sorts of things. Uh, a number of uh, informers or people we ran who were connected to these sorts of jihadi groups used to say they had a very genuine sense of betrayal mm -hmm. by the state. Mm -hmm. uh, and you couldn't fault them from their point of view. Right, right. Uh, you know, they used to say that, uh, you know, uh, well, you know, because the world changes and sort of it's, it's a different set mm -hmm. of rules, all of a sudden we're caught on the wrong foot. Mm -hmm. uh, how is this our fault? Right, right. Uh, and that's, that's very much what I've tried to portray in mm -hmm. the book as well. That at different points in time, whether it's been uh, to do with jihadis or mm -hmm. in fact parties like the MQM, mm -hmm. uh, at different points in time, uh, you've had the state kind of commit all its resources and tell its minions, mm -hmm. you know, people like myself on the forefront that, yeah, yeah don't worry about it, We're, we've got your back. Go ahead and do this. And, and the, the next minute, the sort of, you know, the game changes yeah, exactly. and they say, well, you know, the narrative uh, yeah, we never told yeah. you to sort of go yeah. there and do that. You're, you're sort of, you're left out on a limb. And, and I think the police is very vulnerable in this mm. because they are usually, as I say, the coercive arm of the mm. state. So they're the ones at the forefront of it. <clears throat> and when the state changes its mind or mm. reverses its decision, they are left exposed. Mm. Uh, and, you know, and we've seen this again, whether it was with ethnic parties or with religious mm. parties, that the sort of, uh, anger of those groups mm -hmm. is then targeted at the police, mm -hmm. not at the deep state okay. whom mm -hmm. they, you know, uh, for whatever reason, do not target mm -hmm. or don't target with mm -hmm. the same amount of frequency, mm -hmm. but at the sort of uh, lower minions of the state. Yeah, of course. Um, I'm going to ask a little bit of a... I'm going to push you in a certain direction. and. Um, and please don't mind, right? I'm going to read no. something. Um, it's from page uh, 237. Um, I was in the camp seven years ago. At the time, they used to train fighters for jihad in Kashmir. Some went to Afghanistan. I stayed there for a while and became a trainer in the camp. But what were you doing there six months but what were you doing there six months ago? When the Americans attacked Afghanistan, the camp was shut down. I left and moved to Karachi to find work. Then six months ago, when the fighting in the tribal area started, I wanted to go back. The government forces were bombing our villages and killing innocent women and children. I could not watch it on TV anymore. I wanted to fight. Um, I have family from um, and in Waziristan until recently uh, because they were displaced um, because of the, um, not only the militant, <coughs> but the government um, bombing, the most uh, recently uh, Zarbe Azam and the force with which the government um, since September 11th has um, targeted um, everyday ordinary uh, Pashtuns as part of this momentum shift that you were talking mm -hmm. about after September 11th. Now I'm going to historicize that as an anthropologist and also somebody from those areas um, whose families have been subject to the violence of the state since partition and even before, right? That this isn't something new. And um, the imagination of the Pratan 
not only in colonial British imagination, but in um, the state bureaucrat language of um, the state of Pakistan, which I think um, adds to why I have my personal spy in Pakistan, right? Is that imagination of what a Pathan is and what a Pathan does, right? Um, so although you complicate it here, and I appreciate that, talking about um, really this one character, Kana, and, and where he goes back to, and the fact that ordinary, um, mm -hmm. you know, killing the, the villages, um, the government forces <laughs> are bombing and killing innocent women and children, and I really like that, and that's something to me that doesn't play into the narrative of what's going on in, in KPK and Fatah, right? There are everyday, ordinary people being displaced by the millions, not by the thousands, by the millions, right? Ordinary um, children being bombed and killed, right, that are innocent, that are lost in these things called the global wars on terrors and the Pakistan state's role. Um, where I do want to push you is on um, the figure of the Pathan in your book, right, and how when you um, talk about a Pathan, uh, you have one description of a hooked nose Pathan, one about um, the light uh, skin color of a Pathan. That was on so, the Swatis, though. Uh, Swatis, but still, <laughs> Swatis are, okay. So for me, it's, um, it's the racializing figure of the Pathan. And how, um, for me, um, as a Pathan with a hook nose, that is something that, um, okay, well, okay, but I'm very proud of my hook nose. But the, the, the point is how um, the figure of the baton fits into Pakistan state institutions, imaginations, including the police, including in a, in a, in a city like Karachi, um, to give you some, again, personal background to Karachi. That is one city in Pakistan. And keep in mind, um, I'm from, uh, I travel to Waziristan often and Peshawar, and uh, Daris Mohan, Kohat, this, this is where my family's from. The one city my father absolutely refuses uh, me to have permission to go to is Karachi. And the reason is, is because what you've portrayed in the book, but also because of the racializ racializing of, of Pathans. My Urdu is completely racial. It's very clear that my Urdu is a Pathan Urdu. It's very clear um, based on my hook knot, hook nose, <laughs> that I'm a Pathan. And it's, it's similar to um, the black man and the black person in America. They're racialized. Right, in, um, they're racialized differently in Karachi. They're racialized in your book, and I'm wanting to know um, why you uh, you didn't racialize anyone else in terms of talking about besides um, unhealthy and uh, formerly fit but not very fit police officers. Now they used to be athletes, and now they're you know they're more hoge, they're fat, right? But besides. There's no other racialized figure, right, in your book in terms of talking about features, how that fits into what you talk about, the ethnic um, violence and the political violence, how that relates to the Pakistan state's current um, militant action, um, to, you know, and because, you know, and it's easy. It's easy because as soon as we label um, anything Taliban, any violence is justified, right? And so for me, like I taught a course here at Harvard um, called... Um, Talibanization and its other, right? To really complicate that once you name something Taliban and Taliban-like, any violence is allowed. In Pakistan, that has happened by saying, oh, it's the Taliban over there in Fatah. So then drones are allowed, all kinds of stuff is allowed, right? Feminist organizations back the state and the army, you know, displacing millions of women and children, and these are feminist organizations, and you're wondering, and once you write the Taliban, yes. anything is allowed. Yeah violence, right, to fight against that, right? So I'm, I'm giving you like just some, it's Absolutely. a question to say no. that how it is that you <clears throat> made that decision to, um, to racialize Pratans, how that fits in your job, um, your job as a police officer and how Pratans were complicated, and just to give us some of that. It's interesting, I think um, you're absolutely right that in, in Karachi um, you have had this narrative put up by, let me answer the, the first part of your question first. As far as I'm concerned, I didn't put a lot of thought into my writing. So uh, I can't. But that is a lot too, right? That's just. But, <coughs> because but I mean, what I'm trying to say is that, um, so I mean, it may well be on my part a more sort of uh, a casual uh, approach to it. But I think that the point that you make is a very fair one. And I think because 
what you've seen, especially in the past uh, six, seven years, and, and remember here that uh, there's been this narrative portrayed by a lot of, uh, well, principally by the MQM, which is the, the largest Absolutely. party in Karachi, yeah. where they've said that, you know, the narrative is of some sort of onslaught of uh, terrorists coming from Sawat or uh, South or North Waziristan mm -hmm. coming into Karachi. And in fact... And otherwise uh, they in Karachi. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, you know, Karachi has been a Pathan city uh, for 30, 40, 50 mm -hmm. years. Karachi has more Pathans than Kabul or Peshawar. Mm -hmm. uh, Karachi has, I think, uh, uh, by rough estimate, something like four or five million mm -hmm. uh, people of Pashtun origin. Mm -hmm. Uh, in f most of the, uh, and one of the most interesting things that I found uh, working in CID as a police officer was that actually it was when we looked at uh, TTP cell leaders mm -hmm. or whomever working in Karachi, actually it was not people coming from North or South Waziristan. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, when you looked at the leadership structure of the TTP, you found a number of people who were Karachiites. Mm -hmm. They may have been Mesud, yeah. uh, and but born and brought up in Karachi mm -hmm. all their lives, right. which in fact gave them the edge in these organizations because mm -hmm. they were okay. essentially cosmopolitan. Mm -hmm. uh, they're much more savvier than sort of, you know, uh, people from the village. Their ability to plan complex mm -hmm. operations was better. And so it was much easier for them to rise within these organizations. So, you know, you found a number of uh, the leadership caste within mm -hmm. the TTP to be these Karachi mm -hmm. uh, Pathans, uh, you know, Mesuds or, mm -hmm. or, or whomever, who had then, who had gotten, uh, attained a certain level in Karachi and then moved, mm -hmm. you know, into a more senior uh, position uh, in the tribal areas. Mm -hmm. So it was a reverse thing. Uh, what you found, again, coming uh, uh, from the, the sort of groups operating in Karachi, I, I'm talking about the TTP and its various affiliates, was again that, uh, in fact, I remember that, um, Initially, uh, when I went, when I joined CID, uh, you know, we, I was still new at the sort of counterterrorism thing. So we started on on information arresting various uh, members of the Sawati Taliban, mm -hmm. and uh, actually the Sawatis had done nothing in Karachi and didn't plan to do anything because they were mostly people who had loosely kind of uh, joined the TTP when it was at its high point in 2009 in Sawat. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, when the army operation broke things up, they kind of like abandoned the affiliation and came to hide mm -hmm. in Karachi so because it had, you know, it's a good place to hide. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and they were not <coughs> actively involved in anything. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones who were, were again Karachiites, often professional criminals, uh, who found that joining the TTP uh, became a convenient cover yeah, nice. for the rest of their criminal, criminal activities. activities. So, right, right. you know, they, were, they may have been in the ANP previously mm -hmm. uh, and they may have been sort of sticking red flags mm -hmm. into pieces of land that they wanted to kind of forcibly mm -hmm. capture and then decide, yeah, you know, a black flag has much more impact and we can get okay. more extortion yeah, yeah. money from that. So essentially it was a kind of, this whole narrative uh, of Karachi being flooded mm -hmm. by these, uh, by sort of these hordes, mm -hmm. was a false one. Uh, and it, and when you look again at the sort of a lot of the high profile individuals arrested or killed, uh, when you look at sort of various jihadi organizations, whether it's a Sunni extremist one like Lashkari Jangvi or whether it's, uh, you know, one of the others mm -hmm. like Jandullah, you find in fact uh, that they are quite uh, multicultural in mm -hmm. their ethnicity. Mm -hmm. uh, you have sort of uh, Mahajir uh, boys, you have Punjabi, mm. Southern Punjabis, uh, you have Baloch, mm. uh, you have Sindhis. Mm. <laughs> so there is no sort of uh, monopoly on uh, on ethnicity at mm. all. Mm. And it was obviously a very, very different story. And indeed, uh, when the MQM kind of started this back in around 2008, 2009, they did it because uh, it, it was a very well calculated measure because Absolutely. they saw the demographics of mm. the city changing. Uh, and those demographics in the long run were not running in their favor. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the MQM that had up till 2008, uh, sort of over the previous 10 years, pushed itself as, in fact, they had dropped the name Mahajir from their party, mm -hmm. uh, from their party title. Mm -hmm. uh, they reverted to the politics of the mid-80s when mm -hmm. it had been a Mahajir versus Pathan, Pathan issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
they reverted to those sorts of politics. They reverted to the sorts of things that we saw in 1986 mm-hmm. uh, in Orangi town mm-hmm. and you know Kasbah colony and places like that where. Uh, you know, uh, someone was targeted just because they looked Pathan, right. uh, you know, just because they looked like they had a hook nose, whether mm-hmm. they could have been from Sialkot, right, for that right, matter. Right. Uh, but you saw that, you saw cycles of that in 2009 and kind of running all the way uh, till 2011-12, mm-hmm. almost, I'd say, all, almost to the current day. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I totally agree with that, mm-hmm. with your point over there, that there has been this racialization. Mm-hmm. Uh, of Pathans uh, in Karachi. Mm-hmm. By the political parties yeah. in the state. Oh, By the, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, another question, just um, the role of fiction, right? And why, because it's very clear and, and for those... It's great, um, you don't get sued. Yeah, exactly. I was like, is, is that... <laughs> because there's, um, it's very clear for anyone who knows uh, uh, Pakistan, even, you know, just from, uh, you know, of the what's the worst like newspaper? I don't even know. But it, from it, like the Times Magazine or whatever, right? Like if that's your understanding of you, it's very clear that you would know. Okay, this is Daniel Pearl. This is, but it's not because it's a different name. This is MQM, but it's not. This is Altaf Hussein, but it's actually not Altaf Hussein, right? And um, so I'm wondering why you um, decided to use fiction. Not only, and I'm sure it has to do more than just not being sued, right? But also in, you know, and I gave you my personal, you know, what this book and, and every book on Pakistan does to me in the sense of just this feeling of, uh, you know, like um, just the heaviness of those of us who have a relationship to the people and, and, and the place is, um, um, is how, um, I mean, is, is really how fiction works with that imagination to give us something else, right? Because at the end, the American doesn't, um, uh, the same fate of what happened to Daniel Pearl is, is, is slightly different here, right? And uh, it's a semi-spoiler alert, but it's, it's in the sense that it, it, it's slightly different, right? So I, I'm wondering um, is at, at how you made these decisions as, as a writer, and you said you're not, you weren't creative, but in the sense of how it is that your imaginations of a Pakistan or of Pakistanis, right, in, in the way that you used fiction to suspend uh, reality at some points and to suspend what actually happened um, in the lives of some of these characters and whatnot, right? I think fiction gives you a lot of license, uh, you know, apart from the legal niceties of it. <laughs> Uh, gives you a lot of license to take stories. I mean, if you look at the book, they, uh, you know, I, I keep say I keep getting asked that how much of the book is based on fact, and I say that it's probably about ninety percent. But the interesting thing that fiction allows you to do is that uh, it allows you to take stories that may be associated with one individual, uh, or rather, that uh, it allows you to take stories that may be associated with several individuals mesh them into one character right, right, right. to make a much more uh, easier narrative. Right, right, right. Um, and I think it allows you to be very honest. And I think I found this, I, I never, as I said, I didn't put too much thought into it when I started this. Uh, but I found as I wrote the book that fiction allows you to speak great truths. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think perhaps a lot of the things that I say in the book that are ground realities for people, for whether it's for police officers, whether mm. it, it has to do with intelligence agencies, political mm. parties, or whatever, I think perhaps I would certainly have found it much more difficult to articulate them mm. had this been a non-fiction book. Mm. Uh, you know, trying to explain those mm. intricacies uh, in a sort of seamless mm. manner. Fiction allows you to do that. Mm. Uh, it allows you to sort of come up with mm. a dialogue or, or a turn of phrase mm. in which you can just sort of say uh, say that truth right, right. in a much more self-evident way. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's nicely put. Because for me, um, I mean, there's uh, lots of fiction books that are written on Afghanistan and also on Fata and um, the, the, the Falcon. I don't know if you've read, you know, but they're, they're, um, it, it, it's how uh, fiction gets used um, to not have to be responsible to the truth. And um, and it and ultimately um, um, it's used in ways that I think um, are more deceptive than actually uh, uh, and more betraying of the truth than closer to it. So in in a in a strange way, fiction actually I think, uh, in my sense, allowed you to be actually closer to the yeah you know and, and yeah. so that's why I I 
um, wanted to ask um, you of that because I, I did um, recognize the various ways and, and the way that you know hopes is suspended. And for, and for me, again, it's personal because how it's just, just this perpetual hope for uh, a people in a place that's always aching to be sort of thing, right? And so it's for me um, always that heaviness at which I. Um, I land in Pakistan and leave Pakistan and, and read books on Pakistan. It's that heaviness. So um, I want to leave um, the last half hour for um, questions um, that you might have, the dialogue, any sorts of things. I know there's uh, one person that has read the book, but other people um, um, that want to share. speed reading over there. Yeah, exactly. For Anybody that, that wants to share <laughs> about anything that he has asked that um, I have um, encouraged him to, to speak about, um, please feel free. Uh, and um, I'm going to ask you, there's a mic here, so before you ask um, your question, if, uh, <coughs> just for recording purposes, if we could wait until the mic is in your hand. And uh, Nora will, will help doing that. Okay, I think we, we have here. And if you want to say your name. Um, and then. Sure, my name is Wasi Amrin. Uh, so my question is, uh, can you talk a little more about why did you join the Sims police, especially coming from a good uh, educational background, good family background, you're just not associated with people coming from that, and do you encourage young people now in LUMS and IBA to, to give their CSS exams and join the police force or not? Um, it's interesting. I think um, in terms of my background, I actually did come from a civil service background in the sense that both my parents were civil servants. Uh, I think this is actually, uh, it's a fallacy that uh, people in, in Pakistan have about you know, there's, there's this sort of narrative that the police is bad because uh, they're not educated. It's a class uh, argument, right? Yeah, and I, I think it doesn't hold true uh, because I think if you look at the sort of academic backgrounds of the people who come through the civil service examinations, people like myself, you will find a number of foreign degree holders. Uh, you will find a number of Ivy League graduates. Uh, the police chief of Islamabad, who was dismissed from service last week, was a Harvard graduate, uh, funnily enough. Uh, that is true. But uh, I think the, the problem, actually, is that we as a body have not provided the leadership that we, was, that we are supposed to provide. So the whole point of having this, you know, sort of army officers and men type of recruitment uh, that you would come in through the civil service exam, you know, you kind of read the classics in a very typical old English civil service type of way, uh, and you join, and you know, you're supposed to be this disinterested civil servant who sort of, you know, provides justice or good governance. Uh, doesn't work because, you know, the whole point of it was that if you bring a 25 or a 26 year old and you make him the head of an administrative subdivision, uh, with control over three or four police stations or control over hundreds of revenue officers or whatever, uh, and essentially give that young man a hell of a lot of power. Uh, what gets him through it is his natural confidence and his sort of, you know, his incorruptibility and all mm. this sort of stuff, which was, this was the classic kind of, you know, English civil service argument. It doesn't hold true anymore. It doesn't hold true because, uh, unfortunately, even those, if we talk about a class argument in terms of background, even those who come from very good backgrounds uh, tend to fall into the same problems as others. So to talk about the police, for instance, unfortunately, you have, uh, we say that the problem of corruption, to take one aspect of it, lies with the lower ranks. And in fact, it doesn't. The problem of corruption lies equally with the senior ranks of the police. And they're the ones who are supposed to provide leadership. The lower ranks at least have an excuse that part of that corruption is driven by their need to keep things running. Uh, if a police station doesn't have a budget, uh, then obviously the, in the officer in charge of that police station needs to do something to buy pens and pencils and put petrol in his uh, you know, police car, uh, his police mobile. Uh, but what is the excuse that uh, you know, the district superintendent has or the inspector general has? So if we don't provide that leadership and we don't, we aren't as good professionally. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I see a lot of the, the sort of young officers coming in and it sounds like everyone says the generation after them is crap, but you know, if we don't, uh, uh, if you don't sort of uh, want to investigate a case, 
by yourself. If you don't want to learn what it takes to have a case, go to court, to run it, to prosecute it, then you know the, the sub-inspector who has 30 years service mm -hmm. of doing this is better than you because if you're corrupt and he's corrupt, he's at least professionally Experience adept. Thing. Yeah, you know, he has <laughs> professional experience. Uh, so I, and you know, to answer the last part of your question, this is not to say that people shouldn't join the civil service, but I think they should have a very clear objective of what they're doing and also not have any kind of illusions of what that world is going to be like. It's a very different world uh, that you go into now. A lot of the sort of uh, perks and a lot of the things that attracted people to the civil service uh, are not there anymore. It's, it's much tougher. Okay. Um, we'll keep we'll Can you pass the mic? Yeah, we'll go here and then we'll go and we'll send it back well, to you. Well, I, I was going to ask that question, but I was also going to ask uh, if you could be a little more detailed, explicit about why you left. You left the, you're no longer associated. I am and on a sabbatical. Oh, you're on a sabbatical. Uh, one, one you'll be going back. The, okay. that the very fortunate things about the police is that you can, as long as you're not asking them for a job, uh, they're quite happy for you to disappear for a few weeks. Okay, so my question is, what is, uh, what is your present relationship with your colleagues uh, Post book, let's say. Do some of them recognize themselves? Just to add to your, your question, do some it's, of them recognize it's parts of themselves I, I, and parts of these I, I got asked this question uh, last year when the book was still quite new mm -hmm. at the Karachi Literary Festival. And someone asked me that, you know, what has been the reaction from within the police? And I, you know, made a flippant comment. I said, yeah, you know, the thing with cops is they don't really read a lot. <laughs> so I'm safe. I'm absolutely safe in this. I subsequently have found in the, they that was in February <laughs> last year, I subsequently found that a, a larger segment of them read than I thought. Uh, so, you know, that's, they have, uh, they have generally been extremely supportive. Uh, they do play little games amongst themselves trying to guess uh, who's who. Uh, but I think, uh, and I think it's, I, I haven't sort of gotten any negative feedback or it hasn't been a case of, you know, you're selling us out and you're sort of some sort of Serpico type figure. I think because um, while it's not a heroic portrayal, I've tried to do a realistic portrayal. And I think there is an appreciation that, you know, this is a, and it, it's interesting, I've uh, gotten comments from people in Pakistan saying that uh, this has sort of changed our perception of the police. We had a negative perception. And now we kind of understand, perhaps partially, why they sometimes do what they do. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Ali Jafri. I'm a second year student at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy down the street. Um, I'm sorry if I'm getting a little too tactical here. And please uh, correct my assumptions if you find that there are holes in it. But uh, my understanding of, of how the police has sort of been operating in Karachi specifically the last couple of years is sort of as an extension of a military tact uh, tactical uh, extension of the military from a tactical standpoint. Uh, they're kind of the, the tip of the spear uh, for the military, particularly when uh, you're instituting uh, coin or counterinsurgency type policies, which are, you know, seem to be on vogue in Karachi or necessary, according to some. Uh, this, this doesn't allow them to be law enforcement agencies in the traditional sense, uh, in terms of doing investigative work and, and policing uh, and, and being resources and engaging with the community. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit to that. Um, I would say that that's, uh, you know, there's, uh, part of what you're saying is correct, but part of it is, is incorrect. I think the problem, uh, especially in the last couple of years that the Karachi police has had, in fact, that it's had for a while, is that it has become, uh, with the exception of a handful of units, totally disengaged from the process of policing. And you know, that has come a, as a cumulative result of uh, you know, years of political interference, uh, a growing sort of fear, especially when uh, the TTP became very active and started targeting the police, a fear that they were professionally not equipped to handle this sort of insurgency. And so they started taking a back foot. And, and, and part of the problem with that uh, comes that, you know, when you have, uh, we had this sort of phenomenon where f from 2008 to 2013, we had a coalition government in Karachi composed of all the major stakeholders in the province. All those major stakeholders in one form or another backed armed militias. And 
what the problem for the police was that you know, it became a sort of uh, the rule of the day not to go after anyone. So you couldn't say that, uh, well, we're going to go after the MQM because the MQM would say, well, you know, what have we done? The, the People's Party and the Awami National Party, who are the other two coalition members, also have armed wings. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, and so the People's Party would say, well, you know, why, the hell, why are you going after us? It has to be across the board. Uh, and the political dynamics were such that that was not possible. And as I said, the other problem was, of course, that the jihadi threat was such that the normal sort of regular police units felt that they were not equipped to do to deal with that. Oftentimes, uh, you know, when I was in CI, CID was a specialized unit that was focused just on counterterrorism. And a lot of times we knew that the local police had leads which they didn't follow because they'd say, you know, we're not CID. We can't do this. We, we're not sort of going to go after this sort of thing. And as you correctly say that uh, it made the thing more difficult because in fact, in a situation like Karachi's, it is usually the local police station that should have the most intelligence about the area. Uh, it's, it's a lot easier for them because they interact with the people, uh, with the local community on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, you know, it's much easier for them to gain ingress into any criminality mm. that may be going on over there. But we've had a reversal of that. Now, the problem that we've had uh, with the Rangers, which is the paramilitary wing, and, and you know, it's officered by army, it's, you know, uh, essentially the army, um, is that they came in and started taking a more active role uh, in policing in Karachi because of the failure of the Karachi police to do that. And because they were considered a force, because they were sort of affiliated with the military, where there was not going to be political interference. So if the Rangers picked up, let's say, an mm -hmm. MQM activist, mm -hmm. an MQM minister couldn't call up the colonel in charge of that Rangers unit and sort of harangue him into giving up the activist. The problem which you will see, now, which we are already seeing now, and you will see, is that the Rangers are <laughs> not a police unit. They're not trained as police. They're essentially a border security unit, and they're a military unit. Uh, they don't understand uh, the intricacies of investigation. They would not understand things about, you know, chain of evidence of how to make a case. So for them, it's a big success getting hold of a political target killer and, you know, coming out and saying in a press conference that, well, you know, this guy admitted to killing uh, 56 people in, in a year. That's fantastic, but it doesn't hold up in court. And it's the police that has to make those criminal cases. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the problem that we're having now <laughs> is that because the police is not associated uh, with this operation, because it's clearly a ranger's sort of job, uh, they are unable to do that. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're falling into a problem where uh, when the me media headlines go away two months from now, you're going to see, you know, a sea of acquittals because these cases will not hold up. And obviously the various parties involved will, will then say, oh, well, you know, our guys got off. It proves that we weren't involved in this. Not, mm. It doesn't prove that they weren't involved in it. It just proves that it was poor investigation and poor uh, sort of law enforcement management. What is your name? Uh, Ali Jaffe. Ali? Yeah. Okay. Um, just to add to this, if you don't mind, and to your question, um, I really appreciated the question and the answer as well. But just um, simply foc you know, focusing on uh, the militarization of everyday life, right? So how, how that's happening in the United States, right? In places like Ferguson, where a police, um, something that's a police issue, it's, it's, it's a military state, right? So even in the United States, so not exceptionalizing Pakistan, <coughs> to say that something exceptional is happening in Pakistan, but because of this war on terror, that has brought military and military tactics to everyday um, the streets of the United States, right? Where they have tanks, right? So, you know, Ferguson and places in America look like Kabul look like Iraq, yeah. right? And something seri very serious happens in, in America and the way America is actually affecting police forces everywhere. And I, and I think, you know, so I appreciated your question in complicating how the militarization of everyday life is not only happening in the streets of Karachi or Kabul, <coughs> but how it's happening in America, in Ferguson, in New York City, and then how processes of racialization are part of that militarization. Right, so ordinary people of Ferguson <coughs> don't see the police Absolutely. as yeah. their friends. Absolutely. Latinos, Browns, and Black communities in America historically have not. I grew up um, in a predominantly Latino neighborhood in Los Angeles. Whenever I saw police, I ran. Right, but when I started going to suburbs and school with white children, 
they always smiled and, and, and looked at the police as friendly. And I'm like, run, what are you doing? Like, and for them, then I realized this, the processes of, mili of militarization and how and who is seen as the enemy, right? On the everyday, at the everyday level, but then actually at the international level, processes of racialization. And that's you know, how the, the figure of the Bataan and so many other figures fit it's, into these imaginations. It's interesting, right? uh, exactly. just you know, take, to take that point, I, uh, I was speaking to a friend of mine who was a former police officer with the Boston PD. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that, you know, for instance, the LAPD uh, is a f police force whose nature has changed because over the past 10 years or so, they have actively pursued a policy of preferring uh, recruits who had had former military experience. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what has happened is that uh, you have police officers on the street uh, who are police officers. So it's not a case like the Rangers in Karachi who are actually a but paramedic. Right, the but, the, but, the, but the mentality or the approach of the officer mm -hmm. is in fact comes, he draws upon, he or she draws upon their military background. And it's literally shoot to kill. <coughs> it's exactly. not shoot to wound. It's, it's like in a war zone, you shoot to kill. It's literally increasing torture in territory. No, absolutely. It's too, so for example, the um, Chicago police force. Yeah. Right, right. No, so, so thanks, sure. Ali, because I think your question is, is, is relevant yeah. not only to Pakistan, but to militarization of everyday Absol life yeah. in, in, in America. Um, can we, we had a question here. Do you want to go with your comment, sure. please? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, just um, to, to clarify a little about Frank Serpico, who I had the great pleasure of actually meeting. Um, Frank Serpico was a good guy, and he did a really amazing thing. So he, he, I, I think it would have been a mistake to want to disassociate yourself from what he did. Frank Serpico was somebody who didn't want to go along with, with m systemic corruption in the police department and um, ended up at a point where he was actually in a, you know, an undercover drug, I think an undercover drug unit, and was set up in a way that, you know, they were going to let him get killed, not by themselves, but by somebody else. Yeah. Sir, what is your name? Um, James Williamson. James, um, James, do you mind just giving like a one minute brief thing on who Serpico is? So <coughs> well, Frank Serpico was a New York City police officer who... Um, Exposed corruption. Right, no, I know. Who in his, in his beginning experience, uh, as he tells the story, and, I mean, I heard him, when I heard him in person telling the story, mm -hmm. of course, there's the movie, which I've also seen, but, and a book, but um, one of his very fir first experiences, he's in a police car, and there's a traffic stop, and his, his senior partner, uh, he goes to, to get the identification, and he comes back, and he says to his, his partner, he wants to give me... Um, Forty dollars. He wants to give me a bribe, and um, the senior partner says, <coughs> "Well, we'll take it." Mm -hmm. And he goes, "Well, I don't want to. I just don't feel comfortable doing that." Mm -hmm. And and he says, "Come on, take it." And he says, "No." And the senior officer says, "Okay, d never mind. You stay here. I'll take care of this." And he goes and presumably takes the money. Takes and the and another another early experience. Um, he's uh, uh, there's been a. a, a Situation involving uh, a you know a sus suspected assault, and uh, they've got a suspect, and the, his <coughs> senior partner says, "Flake him, flake him, yeah, flake him, plan a plan a knife on him," and he says, "Well, I don't want to do that. I mean, he doesn't didn't have a knife that I'm aware of. Well, flake him." Mm -hmm. So he says, "No." So he <coughs> does, he does not want to participate in a systemic culture of corruption and. And, and lying and, and framing of, mm -hmm. of suspects. When I heard him give the speech, he was talking about the invasion of Iraq. And he was comparing his experience as a New York City police officer. He says, what they're trying to do now with Saddam Hussein, they're, trying, they're flaking him. Mm -hmm. He has weapons of mass destruction. Mm -hmm. So it was, he was in, been invited by a peace group. Someone That's had met totally him. Flaking. It was very interesting. <laughs> so, um, so I, I just the way you said, you know, I'm no Frank Serpico. You know, I the, mean, I know you didn't really no, mean it. No, no, James but no, but actually, but. the point uh, that I mean that was that uh, if you look at Serpico's history, Serpico, absolutely, there's, there's no sort of question that he uh, was, you know, a white knight and sort of did the right thing. But if you go back to that period, there was a lot of resentment oh, and yes. hatred yeah. towards him. In fact, right. I, I've, I, uh, I remember reading the book uh, many years ago, and there were things like when he was shot and trying to recuperate in hospital, 
He was, even while he was a police officer who had been shot in the line of duty, Definitely. he was receiving hate Definitely. mail right. Uh, right. from his colleagues. Right. So I think that, that was the point that I was trying to make, yeah. that, okay. uh, yeah. you know... That he hasn't the, received the, death mail yet <coughs> <laughs> from his colleagues. The police forces generally, anywhere in the world, tend to be very closely knit. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, they tend to view anyone who sort of... They tend to be, generally speaking, conservative in their outlook, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. And they tend to be very, very fraternal. Mm -hmm. And across the board, I mean, Serpico is an ex is an extreme example, but across the board, you do find that if uh, you know you have people who sort of do something different, uh, or or not, I won't say speak out, but like speak about things that go on within mm -hmm. that subculture. People say sort of people don't say oh well that's interesting you know yeah. that you're doing that people sort of say oh that's well why would you do that you know yeah. uh, it's it, well, th that that sort of mentality is there across the board I think I mean, well yeah and I think you're right I think yeah. it's, it's a code of silence but but I did, and I did have a question but the uh, what just to finish the, up the bit about Serpico that his his what happened to him led to a, 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 a commission the the NAP commission in New York was a major investigation of corruption in the New York City Police Department. And Serpico now runs in upstate New York, which means you know a few miles north of New York City. It mm -hmm. doesn't mean really upstate, as we would understand it. But he has a center where police officers who have been through trauma <coughs> can come and share their experiences uh, yeah. you know, and, and have a kind of a retreat. And you know, you can just, New York Times had an interesting article <coughs> not long ago about it. But, um, my question is, um, first of all, I was intrigued. You said the, 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 head of the, uh, the person who was just fired, just dismissed. Why was he dismissed, if you understand what happened there? But the larger question is with the involvement of uh, the United States in policing and mil the military uh, <coughs> in, in Pakistan, the one case that comes most readily to mind is the CIA officer, I believe. Raymond who, Davis. Davis, who um, was, you know, ar arrested and then, you know, then, <coughs> of course, I knew that he was going to be released. We all knew that he would eventually, they would find a way to release him. But um, is the involvement of the U.S., and, the, and uh, is it helping the situation or is it not? Because the argument among, say, the peace movement in America is that the way the U.S. is approaching the situation is actually aggravating the situation, is generating people who then might become what we might call a, a terrorist. The way they chose to go after Osama bin Laden has ruined the polio vaccination uh, program, some would argue, in Pakistan, where there are now peak cases of polio that there haven't been. Um, so is, it, is, is, is the U.S. helping? The Wonderful situation. Question, <coughs> Thanks for that context. We can hand it over to Chris. Wonderful. Just um, uh, should I take them a, yeah. as a group? Oh, you want you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, uh -huh. uh, sure. Why not? Um, I'm I'm not sure if I can because uh, it was fresh in my mind like while you were talking. So I actually <coughs> want to push back a little bit on uh, what you were saying, uh, Professor Dolitze, about. Uh, so my name's Kasim. I'm from Peshawar as well, oh, okay. and I. Um, so uh, you, you kind of said like the racialization is like an in-group, out-group thing. So uh, Pashtuns are kind of like out-group and, uh, and they're kind of being coerced <laughs> by the nation state that is Pakistan. So I just wanted to ask what you guys thought about the fact that it's more like what's actually happened is it's in-group on top of in-group. So the Pashtuns are within the state and so within the military institutions as everybody has complicated Absolutely. relations. Yeah, yeah. So a good example would be Hamid Gul, who was in charge yeah, of the yeah. ISI and then the depth they were looking for Afghanistan and stuff. So maybe we could complicate that more. Or talk no, more I wasn't about meaning that. to do yeah. in-group, out-group. I was, kind of, you know, because there's many Pathans that are part of yeah. army establishments and historically, you know, Ayub Khan and leaders of Pakistan. So it wasn't that an in-group, out-group because I don't really know what that means. But it was about complicating, complicating, uh, and maybe the, what what uh, uh, discipline are you in? Is it political? Oh, so uh, I'm uh, economics applied math, but I le read some uh, anthropology books right, on okay. Pashtuns and stuff. If you study yeah. economics, you read everything but your textbooks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 what a wonderful question, Hassan. Thank you so much. Um, did um, you want to? Uh, yeah, let me yeah. let me start with yours. Um, the first one about the the case of um, the Islamabad police chief uh, who has been dismissed from service last week. Uh, his name's Muhammad Ali Nekokara. He was at Harvard, not very long ago actually, I think he was here maybe 08, 09, something like that. 
uh, perhaps even later than that. Uh, I believe so. I believe. Was he at the law school? Well, I stand corrected. Uh, the Oh. Some interesting characters come out of Kennedy. I would put my money on Kennedy. It's <laughs> it's it's an interesting thing. He went back. Uh, he was posted as the police, the senior superintendent of police for the Islamabad police, uh, the the sort of police chief for the capital, uh, from August last year till about December. You had these uh, mass anti-government protests in Islamabad, which were called in the sort of local colloquial language dharnas. Mm -hmm. And they were being led by one political party, uh, the PTI, which has the government in, in KPK province. Mm -hmm. And they were calling for the ouster of the government. Now, you know, the standoff continued for several months. Uh, at various points o over these four or five months, uh, there were various sort of clashes between the police and the protesters. At one point, the protesters sort of, uh, they were protesting on the edge of where Parliament is and where the sort of secretariat is mm -hmm. uh, at various points in time, you know, they, at times they sort of went in and for, for short periods of time seized control of state uh, buildings like the state television mm -hmm. offices and stuff like that. There was a debate throughout this period as to w at what point should the government resort to force to disperse the protesters. Uh, you know, the protesters, uh, I wasn't there, but by all accounts, all neutral accounts, they had been sort of inflammatory at times, obviously going and seizing government buildings and all, you know. Uh, so there was a, a very lively debate within government circles as to whether or not, uh, you know, they should be forcibly ejected. The government's reservation, uh, or rather the, why the government didn't go to that as option mm -hmm. number one, was because prior to that, in July, there had been a similar incident in Lahore, mm -hmm. uh, in which, in again, attempting to remove barricades at 3 a.m. for some strange reason, uh, the Lahore police had opened fire and I think 14 or 15 people had been killed. And again, they belonged to an opposition political party. There were women amongst that. Mm -hmm. The police claimed that they had been fired upon, but there was they weren't really able to substantiate that claim. And so that had put a lot of pressure on the government uh, to not do that. At one point during this episode, the government felt a little more confident uh, in terms of its ability to sort of, because I think the numbers of protesters, because of the length of the protests were going down. And at one point, uh, so the story goes, uh, they said, right, you know what? We can sort of get rid of them now. There's only about two, three hundred uh, during the day. Uh, they kind of get together in the evening. If you go in, in during the day and you sort of remove them, it's you know easy peasy, no problems. Uh, and Mr. Nekukara <clears throat> said refused. He said that uh, he wrote a letter, uh, and as someone who's a common friend of his and mine, said that that was something. Writing memos is something you learn very well at Harvard. So perhaps it's it's really Harvard's fault for him getting fired. Uh, he wrote a letter to the government saying that he believed that as the police chief, this was the wrong policy, and that it would lead uh, to casual to civilian casualties, and that uh, and he requested that you know he did not want to carry out this policy. So if the government wanted to uh, go ahead with it, which was their sort of prerogative, he should be removed. And he was quite happy to sort of uh, remove himself from his post. Uh, and uh, I'll add here that traditionally this has been a, uh, you know, a, a lot of times there have been officers who have sort of said, no, we will not go along with what the government wants to do. And so this has been a way of sort of, you know, uh, without it becoming embarrassing for the government, you know, to say that, well, you know, if you, I won't do it, remove me, get someone else, get whoever you want, you know, I, I'm happy with that. So it, it, it's, it's been pretty standard fare. Um, so that's what happened. He, he, he sort of removed himself from the scene. He left. Subsequently, so uh, that's not a resignation. That's no, no, no. That was just that was just a request that you know uh, post me out from this particular post, post me somewhere else, post someone else in. I disagree with this policy. Mm. Uh, subsequently, you know this these political protests wrapped up after this attack on a school in in Peshawar, and and the whole focus changed. But it seems as if the government is a little sort of ticked off that uh, you know Mr. Nekukara wrote them a letter. So they initiated an inquiry against him, uh, an inquiry that, you know, again, I haven't gone through the papers, but just looking at some of the names of the people who were part of the inquiry, I would say was, you know, it was a rigged table. 
And they said that, uh, in fact, I think there's a famous line from the inquiry which has been quoted in the press where they said that one should not, one of the inquiry officers in ruling against Mr. Nekokara said that one should not be the government's fair weather friend. Mm. Uh, what he means by that, I'm not clear. Um, you know, why we're supposed to be friends with the government. We're just supposed to, you know, uh, we're supposed to be public servants, uh, not friends either way. But on the grounds of that inquiry, uh, Mr. Nekokara was dismissed from service last week. So it, it, it is a bit of a, uh, it, it is becoming uh, a bit of an issue because as I said, this has been a time-honored tradition where civil servants who have disagreed with government policy can remove themselves and it's sort of, uh, in my opinion, it's, it's incorrect for the government to penalize them because the government, as it did do at that time, I'm sure, uh, could easily replace him with someone who may perhaps they found, you know, yeah, uh, would have done what they wanted to do. They didn't do that at that time. Well, he was removed, yes. He left his office uh, and you know, they got someone else to take over. Uh, but, you know, that, that, but apparently this seems to have stuck. The fact that he wrote this letter advising the government not to do this. They feel that he's overstepped his bounds as a public he's servant. A he's, uh, he's not a fair weather friend, as they say. <laughs> <Yes>. <coughs> uh, your second question about uh, whether the U.S. is helping or not. I think... Uh, my impression has been that, you know, there have been various episodes uh, in the U.S.-Pakistan relationship where, where on the face of it, ostensibly, you see these ups and downs and you see the Americans ticked off at the Pakistanis or the Pakistanis ticked off at something. Actually, uh, you know, uh, my sort of analysis of this has been for a while that the military establishments of both countries have actually gotten along very well for a very, very long period of time. And there may be occasional tiffs between them, but uh, you know there uh, there isn't kind of there are sufficient core vested interests on both sides for them to continue that relationship over an extended period of time. What I'm getting at is is the United is is, the, is, is there to the extent that the U.S. have a hand in in, in practices and policies. I'm just wondering, the larger question is, is the U.S. role and the way in which it's being implemented, and I appreciate what you just said, and I'm ready to believe that, is that actually contributing to an aggravation of conflict of, you know, because from the, 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 the not well-informed American point of view is there's a terrorism problem and we've got to do certain things, and I think there are critics who say what the U.S. is doing to the extent that they can be held responsible, isn't helping, it's it's uh, It's tough to say whether or not, uh, whether it's uh, the US involvement has, has, a, has had a positive or negative role. I will say one thing that I think that, you know, uh, whatever the, the, the scale or nature of that involvement, this narrative that I think Pakistan has put on, uh, on public forums that it is an unwanted involvement is incorrect. Uh, you know, I, I'll give you an example of drone strikes. Now, drone strikes are at least publicly portrayed by Pakistan as a major sort of invasion of their sovereignty, sovereignty and all these sorts of things. But the fact is that according to my uh, information, uh, for an extended period of time, drone strikes have been coordinated. Drone strikes, especially the ones recently, have targeted figures that actually were higher value targets from the Pakistani point of view than the U.S. point of view. If I can add very quickly to that, uh, as I said, my family's from Waziristan, but for me, the, the question of drones and, and being a question of sovereignty, in my understanding, came after the capture of Osama bin Laden in Baris, Pakistan. Then it became a sovereignty issue. Then it, because be, prior to that, Right, drones yeah. weren't really in the debate in Pakistan yeah. about a sovereignty issue. Sovereignty became an issue, in my understanding, after um, yeah. what happened uh, of the event yeah. surrounding the capture of bin Laden. And we, for uh, me, on um, the other on the other side of the border, I think um, you know there, a lot has been made of this of the fact that currently uh, Pakistan, the U.S., and Afghanistan are cooperating on unprecedented levels. Mm -hmm. You know, in fighting sort of militants on both sides of the border, the Pakistanis have gotten a lot of kudos for taking out a lot of the good Taliban mm -hmm. elements, people like the Haqqani network and all, and that have been appreciated by the U.S. for doing so. Uh, at the same time, uh, the minute that uh, President Ashraf Ghani removed 
the sort of ban that had been in place on drone mm-hmm. strikes that had been put in place by President Karzai. This mm-hmm. is a ban on drone strikes in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan yeah. I think the first drone strike was in November 16th or November mm-hmm. 20th or something. Uh, and then there was another one on the 3rd of December, 4th of December, and, and indeed one on the 16th of December, which was the day of the Peshawar, Peshawar. school attack. All of those strikes came in eastern Afghanistan and they targeted not the Afghan Taliban but the Pakistani Taliban, which again shows that the high value targeting mm-hmm. going on and the use was for, you know, those were the targets that the Pakistanis mm-hmm. had presumably requested. Uh, and th- it wasn't sort of, you know, uh, so I think there there is, uh, it's tough to say when you have this kind of atmosphere, whether it's, the net result of U.S. involvement has been positive or negative. It's, it's you know, I'm, I'm not clear. Uh, I don't think it's as an issue, it's as clear as that. It, it has a lot to do with Pakistan's own kind of understanding or sort of schizophrenia about where it wants to be. And, and so, yeah, to, for me to complicate um, uh, uh, an answer that I appreciate in the sense of complicating it that it's not so easy to say whether it's good or bad. For uh, for me, it is very much a, a class issue and a metropole issue. For maybe people in Islamabad and Lahore and Karachi, it has been helpful. For people in uh, KPK and Fatah, absolutely not, mm-hmm. right? And so it's very easy to say, okay, Bhutans are very critical of of the America and they hate them. Well, if you look at, pol- I mean, my, my new project, I'm a medical anthropologist, is on polio and the return of polio to Peshawar. Right, so very clearly I can show not only historically but the actual role that has been played. And it's the everyday uh, Pratan, the everyday ordinary innocent you know, child in Waziristan or in Peshawar you know, at, at the school massacre right, that have to endure the, any of the fight or benefit that comes from what America is doing. Right? And it's who bears the burden and how is it that we look in the history of Pakistan but also contemporarily um, how that plays out in class how that plays out um, by labels such as tribal, right? And these are all the things that I, uh, I encourage everyone to continue to as they, they try to understand Pakistan is how then it gets differentially uh, distributed. And the class is a huge factor in that, but also positionality um, geographically and, and other, mm-hmm. right? That, that then uh, adds even more complication to, to a question that is hard is, is what is the fight and benefit that comes from and anything, the U.S. role. It, it's, it's concentrated in cities, and that's why there's this liberal impulse to say we need the Americans to sort out that Taliban, right? Because they're the ugliest thing that has happened to Pakistan. And I would, I would say that's, that's even a simplistic thing, right? Um, do you want to answer, Qasim? Yeah, Very... I think uh, it's interesting. Uh, you know, when we talk about sort of uh, racialization or sort of uh, insiders or outsiders, uh, there's, I mean, it, Looking at Pathans, uh, perhaps if you were to, if you were a Sindhi uh, or a Baloch and you put this to them, they would laugh in your face and they would say, are you kidding me? The Pathans are part of the Pakistani establishment. Uh, because have you ever looked at what's done to us? Uh, and so I think, I mean, you know, I think certainly uh, the Pathans uh, were one part of uh, were one ethnicity who were able to join the establishment very early mm-hmm. on. I think what what has changed or, what, or or what's happened now is that after perhaps almost fifty years of having been a very integral part, probably going back to Ayub Khan and and things like mm-hmm. that of of the Pakistani establishment, mm-hmm. now you find uh, that the sort of war on terror, you know, upended things to mm-hmm. an extent. Uh, but I also think that, uh, and again, you know, this is my impression having, I've not served in KPK, but having spoken to colleagues there and generally sort of having gone there uh, on shorter visits, um, this whole issue of, of uh, terrorism has actually, in many ways, uh, confounded Pathan society. Uh, a lot of uh, their, uh, a lot of the positives of, of the society or the culture have been turned against them. They're almost, in my opinion, they, they've been caught out uh, through in a mess not of their creation, you know, mm-hmm. because they're being squeezed on both sides. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had, uh, you know, again, to, to illustrate this with an example, perhaps to make it more clear, there was a uh, inspector who was in charge of a police station in Karachi. He was a Mesood. And at one point in time, 
uh, you know, we I was in CID and we had information that he was in contact with elements of the TTP or that they operated in his area and he didn't take action against them. So we, uh, you know, we sort of called him up informally and we said, what the hell are you doing? And he said, I can't. Uh, I said, well, we said, why? He said, well, my village is in South Wazirsan. Uh, you know, he and he related a story of how uh, a few months prior to this, he had accidentally, not understanding that, that this person was with the, affiliated with the TT, he had picked somebody up, as you do, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for some minor offense and locked them up. And he received uh, a call from uh, from one it of the was, top TTV yeah. leaders saying, okay, so you think that, you know, you can pick up our people mm -hmm. now. Uh, we know where you live. This is your family's mm -hmm. Shajra. This is, this mm -hmm. is where, where your village is. Uh, we will not only send a suicide bomber to blow up your police station, we'll also wipe out your family. Mm -hmm. He actually had to go back to uh, Waziristan and pay an indemnity. Mm -hmm. So he paid something like the equivalent of uh, 1 million rupees, 1 or 2 million rupees as a fine to the Taliban, to the, to the TTP for having incorrectly, you know, arrested one of these people, which was not in his knowledge. He lived in Karachi. He was not, you know, uh, mm. he probably, other than his annual sort of leave or something, mm. never even went to the, he, and he had lived in Karachi throughout, as in, he, you know, he was a 20-year sort of veteran of the force. But it's this sort of, uh, prob and this is, this is what has become uh, a problem, I think, that uh, it's uh, this onslaught, uh, of terrorism and this not just sort of you know Pathans but also the mixing so for instance when you introduced all these other kind of fighters coming in across the border from Tora Bora whether it was Arab fighters but then also the Chechens Pakistan state's all. role in that right yeah. because it, it hasn't been yeah. an innocent role yeah. it has you not, know yeah. it, it ha right so it, it's complicating that by not just focusing on specific groups and how it is they came yeah. but the Pakistan states you know, I mean, active I, participation there, there are people in who've been who've been in uh, these sorts of areas who've actually said that we don't know who is, you know, which is the good side. Is it the mm -hmm. army or is it the Taliban? Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at night the the sort of army major right, right. and the Taliban guy are having dinner together. Right, right. You know, so mm -hmm. we're not quite sure which side. Uh, mm -hmm. Are we supposed to sort of give information? Mm -hmm. Are we not? It's 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 very it's very convoluted. It's become very complex, yeah. and I think that's a problem yeah. throughout uh, that that province and that mm -hmm. whole region uh, will will sort of face for a while. Yeah, I and these are my young cousins that had to move from Madrasmak and Waziristan to Peshawar that were saying, okay, so historically we. have the state has been against us because we were against the creation of Pakistan. Now the Pakistan state is against us because they're active. And the U.S. drones are dropping on our head because that's the reason we have to leave. So we're on the hit list of the Taliban the hit, because they're nonviolent and they were Khudaik and Ladgars. So we're nonviolent. Yeah. We're, so where do they we're anti-state and the U.S. is dropping things. So there's a high price you pay for being nonviolent and you're on everyone's enemy list, right? So um, we're at the end of time, and I don't know. Can we take one more, Nora? I don't know because there's. Uh, I, I, I mean, I'm getting a, learning a lot from this discussion, but I don't want to again keep anyone here. Uh, what is your name, and if you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. My name is Bina Sarwar. I'm a journalist from Pakistan, living in Cambridge now. Um, I just wanted to ask you what we discussed earlier, also about you know. What you said just now sort of struck me about the army major and the Taliban guy that having dinner together, and I just want you to talk. Would like you to talk about a little bit about what the Peshawar attack has done, and whether anything is really going to change on the ground for Pakistan in terms of you know as you said with the uh, Pakistani state having been so complicit in the creation of these forces, com complicit in creating, nourishing, and you know arming, training, whatever, mm -hmm. since, since the first Afghan war, particularly. Mm -hmm. And ha is, are, do, you really, do you see things changing or going in a better direction? A great question, I yeah. think, especially um, when you ground it with the, the attacks on, because it was a very um, different national response from, from the, the killing of children, right, in, in Peshawar and, and how yeah, that... I just want, to, just want to add to that, what you said yeah. about the national response to the killing of children in yeah. Peshawar. What you said about tribals and all of that, yeah. well, just I think the year before was that, or the year before that, the football field in Lucky Marwat that was uh, attacked, and mm. I think uh, how many, 140 people mm. died, something mm. like uh, that, and killing a lot of children. Mm. But you know, that was not in Peshawar, it was not an army school, it exactly. was, they were 
quote unquote tribals and right, right. you know that wasn't didn't re- bring out the same exactly. level of outrage similarly the shia mambaras that are being attacked a lot of children being killed in there too we don't see that i, I was you, i was going to say that i think uh, and again not to downplay uh, the tragedy uh, that happened occurred yeah. in peshawar in any yeah. way but one of the questions that a lot of shia in pakistan raised were that you know similar atrocities mm-hmm. were committed uh, in quetta on the sort of shia hazara mm-hmm. community uh, there were several attacks on them uh, starting in early 2013 mm-hmm. to date almost uh, but they did not seem to elicit the same kind of national response mm-hmm. the issue of whether or not it this national response is a genuine change of heart or whether uh, you know it's another sort of game within a game uh the guys who sort of write game of thrones should really learn something <laughs> from the pakistani <laughs> uh that's you know it's uh it's something it, it's a point that has yet to be uh tested and i think the reason for that is that uh from from what i've uh, heard from people within on on that side of the fence within the, the deep state uh ostensibly they say that look you know uh, there's been a change uh there's been a generational change in in within the military so the generation now in charge are the ones who have kind of been bearing the brunt of terrorism in pakistan for the past 10 12 years uh so their thinking is now sort of you know my colleagues were mm. killed or whatever rather than there's a great game and and you know mm. we have to sort of push mm. these pawns around uh there's there's a there's also uh, again i'm relating a point of view uh the, there's a thing that you know they had to go about it systematically uh, they started with the operation in the tribal areas they started with greater cooperation with afghanistan because they also understood that uh, you cannot have a stable pakistan without a stable afghanistan uh, and you know you can't have your puppet it was just not going to be possible to have your puppet in afghanistan mm. you would have to deal with whoever is there mm-hmm. and you you will have to find a common ground with them and fine you have certain interests there but obviously it, it, you have to negotiate them um and then this next step of it was karachi because that was again considered the the key sort of uh, point and in karachi uh, any operation had to be across the board so it could not just focus on the ttp or jihadis it had to focus on political and ethnic mm-hmm. parties as well because otherwise again it would become uh, you know a political issue would have to be across the Why board the next step uh, is punjab and and i think really the the proof of the pudding will come there mm-hmm. uh, how they deal with that because mm-hmm. it is the heartland as far as the army is concerned in terms of you know where a majority of mm-hmm. officers and men come from it's a problem where successive governments have been putting their heads in the sand mm-hmm. uh, and not dealing with it by you know pretending it's not there mm-hmm. uh so it, it you know it it's going to be how they go about it uh the next step will i think really show whether or not uh, there is you know there's genuine cause for hope that yes pakistan has turned a corner and and has changed this policy or whether uh, we're going to have another round of good taliban versus bad taliban okay um everyone um if if you don't mind i really uh, if you can ask it after anora and everyone um here uh, everyone here has been extremely patient because we've gone uh, quite a bit over the time i i thank the south asia institute for hosting um uh, omar shahid and and this uh, for me i found a, a great a uh, discussion on on Pakistan and i i hope that everyone is encouraged to to pick up the book if not to um if not only to just um learn more about everyday life but just to um exchange um ideas a- as we have here about how it is we think about um Pakistan in all its complicated uh ways thank you, and, and thank you so much thank you. Thank you.